Hello and welcome to this conversation with Sir Lawrence Friedman to mark the launch of the latest Lowy Institute paper, Modern Warfare, Lessons from Ukraine. I'm Sam Rogovine, Director of the Lowy Institute's International Security Program. The Lowy Institute papers are our flagship publications. They are peer-reviewed long essays written by experts on the key international issues of our time. We're proud to publish these papers in association with Penguin Random House Australia. The paper retails for $12.99 here in Australia, and it's available at all good bookstores as well as online. For those joining us from outside Australia, we recommend purchasing via penguin.com.au. And now to our guest. Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman is a non-resident fellow of the Lowy Institute. He is Emeritus Professor of War Studies at King's College London. Among many distinguished appointments, he was official historian of the Falklands campaign, and in 2009, he served as a member of the official inquiry into Britain and the 2003 Iraq war. He has written on international history, strategic theory, and nuclear weapons. Among his recent books are Strategy, a History, The Future of War, a History, and Command, the Politics of Military Operations from Korea to Ukraine. Laurie's Substack newsletter, Comment is Freed, has become compulsory reading for those following the Ukraine war, and I know it was a rich source of ideas for this Lowy Institute paper, which I had the honour to edit. Sir Lawrence Friedman, welcome back to the Lowy Institute, and congratulations on the publication of this fine paper. Good to be with you. So, Laurie, let's start at the beginning, or at least at the launch of Russia's invasion on 24 February last year. Having observed this war closely since then, uh, you've written countless columns and now this book. Are you any closer to understanding why Putin did it? I think we know why he did it in the sense of his reasons, what he hoped to achieve. I mean, the difficulty I think many of us faced, which I faced before the full-scale invasion when I was one of the sceptics as to whether he would do it, is why would you do something which was inherently so difficult, which is to subjugate uh, an entire country which is uh, historically hostile uh, to Russian control, certainly uh, over the last uh, 20 years. So um, the, 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 the puzzle was uh, not what he was trying to achieve because it has always been difficult for Russia to accept Ukraine as an independent country, not, um, in a sense, part of the Russian sphere of influence. Um, the puzzle, really, w w was uh, why did he think he could get away with it? And I suppose um, there's a degree of hindsight because he obviously didn't get away with it uh, uh, as anticipated if certain things had gone right for the Russian armed forces, if the FSB... Uh, had been able to assassinate um, Zelensky right at the start, if they had moved into Kiev, would we be talking about a very different uh, situation and assessment and saying how bold and uh, audacious he was? So uh, a lot depended on, on the success of the operation, which, as we now know, failed. So... Let me now ask you a simple, and you might well say justifiably simplistic or reductionist question. Who's winning? It's a very important question um, because there is, an, there is a distinction between uh, not winning and losing. Um, it's very difficult for either side to lose at the moment in a traditional military sense by having their armed forces defeated. It's hard. We can't imagine um, Ukraine sort of marching to Moscow uh, and overthrowing this government as the Allies did at the end of the Second World War to Berlin. I and mean, that's not how it's going to end on the Russian side. It's very hard for them to lose um, in, uh, in a sense that would be easily recognised as having their forces pushed out from all their holdings and so on. Equally, the Ukrainians are, have shown themselves resilient, able to resist, um, and the chances of Russia having yet another go at Kyiv um, for the moment seem remote, certainly as long as the Allies continue to support them. So we're looking at the implications of not winning, which are difficult for both sides. Uh, for Ukraine, it's frustrating because uh, it's exhausting. 
um, the, the the casualties are painful. Uh, you, you've got to keep the, the uh, society and the economy mobilized, and you've got to uh, uh, keep on nagging your allies for support. For Russia, I think we tend to discount the importance of not winning. There's a sort of assumption in a lot of the discussion that the, the, the only problem is that the West doesn't try diplomacy enough, and that if Zelensky could only come to terms with losing some of Ukraine's territory, you could have a peace. But there's no evidence of that from the Russian side. There's no evidence that Putin is satisfied with the current uh, situation, that if a ceasefire was declared today, he would think this was a good outcome. Uh, and that's because uh, he's, uh, last in September 2022, he expanded Russian objectives by annexing um, four additional provinces to Ukraine, which he doesn't hold at the moment. Um, and the idea of having bits and pieces of Ukrainian territory, which is battered, depopulated, uh, will require substantial reconstruction and subsidy, and uh, will be difficult to occupy and defend while the rump Ukraine goes off to the EU and, and NATO. I don't think he sees that as a good outcome. So, uh, uh, not winning is a real problem for both sides, but, but also for Russia. Uh, and I think that's what makes the current situation frustrating for both, because it's not uh, not easy to see how it ends, um, because neither has got a real incentive at the moment to end it on, on the uh, current uh, disposition of forces and, and holding. So we're certainly going to come back to the question of how this war ends, because that's where sure. your book ends as well, uh, is to offer a quite a pessimistic assessment on uh, yeah. on that question, as, as I think we've just heard, actually. But before we get to that, there's a few other issues that we should cover. Um, and first of all, yeah. I wanted to ask you uh, that what, about one of the key themes of your book. In fact, the framing device that you use to understand the, the Russia-Ukraine war, and that is the distinction between classical and total warfare. Can you explain yeah. briefly those two terms and how they relate to this war? Yeah, I, so um, the classical approach, um, which is favoured still in the West, uh, is basically... Uh, that you win wars by defeating the enemy armed forces. Um, uh, and the, as much as possible, you confine the war to battles um, uh, and military operations. Uh, this is, uh, even if Ukraine might be tempted on occasion to do something different, um, the fact is it's fighting on its territory um, and it doesn't want its civilians to be harmed, so it has every incentive to stick to the what I call the, the classical approach. The Russian armed forces don't um, don't disregard that; they they want to win their battles too. Um, but it's very much part of the of the Russian strategy um, to put pressure on Ukrainian society and economy as much as possible, um, which was very evident in the period from sort of autumn to spring last year um, with the attack on Ukrainian critical infrastructure. But you can see it in the bombardment of residential buildings uh, when they're trying to take territory. They don't. It's not always that they deliberately attack civilians. Sometimes they do. Um, it's, it, it's largely for intimidation, for coercion, um, or just because they're careless. But it's a much more total approach. Um, the, the, they they seek to gain victory by bringing down the current social and economic order, if you like, in in Ukraine, while Ukraine seeks to gain victory by um, beating the, the Russian armed forces and, uh, and pushing them to withdraw. Now, on on Russia's total war approach, do you expect Moscow to target Ukraine's energy infrastructure again, as it did last winter? And I'll just add, last year, those attacks had well and truly begun by October, but we haven't mm. seen a concerted campaign yet this winter, have we? No, uh, it, it's an interesting question. So, you know, as I tried to point out in, in the book, the, uh, uh, although, the, although Ukraine in the end survived this campaign, 
it, it was touch and go at times. It, it, this was this was a real challenge. Now um, they've done a number of things to prepare for it this time round. Um, they've thought much more about resilience, how they repair um, the the, the um, electricity system, their energy systems, their water systems, all the things that that, that were attacked, um, and they put quite a bit more into air defences. Um, on the other hand, we know that Russia appears to have been stockpiling missiles, um, and it has started some attacks on, or I mean, it's not that they haven't, they've ignored these targets uh, in recent weeks, um, but it hasn't had the sort of dramatic effect that we saw with those massive attacks on, on Kiev and elsewhere uh, that began October-ish last year. Uh, so there is a question as, as to whether uh, this is sort of the, the calm before the storm um, or whether Russia uh, is waiting, I think, uh, and just conserving its missiles for other purposes. I think that in the end, you know, Russia could look at all this effort and, and note it didn't actually work that well last year. Uh, Zelensky has spoken of um, Ukraine's ability to retaliate this time. And, and you know, one of the differences uh, is that there, has, there have been a variety of attacks with drones and sabotage and so on against energy systems, fuel dumps, uh, bases inside Russia proper. So that may be a, 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 a factor. I would still, I have to say, expect something. I mean, I'd be surprised if we got to the spring without a major Russian campaign of this sort, because um, you know, every, nothing else is really making the same sort of difference. Laura, I'd like to ask you now about, what, about what's at stake here uh, in the war for both sides. At the beginning of the Russian invasion, it was pretty clear that the stakes for Ukraine were literally existential. Russia sought the overthrow or the dissolution of the Ukrainian state and possibly even Ukraine's territorial reincorporation into Russia. Uh, if not formally, then at least by way of installing a pro-Russian puppet regime. Yeah. Are the stakes still that high for Ukraine at this stage? Can we say the threat to Ukraine's existence as an independent state is over, even if it risks losing a large part of its territory? Um. So the Ukrainians would say losing 18% of their territory is pretty existential. Um, and um, the fate of those under occupation bothers them. Um, and certainly if any more went under Russian occupation, that would bother them more. I think they're more confident that they can now uh, continue in some shape or form um they have a future but it's very hard to think too hard about your future um when everything is, gets geared to the to the war effort so i think the state for ukraine is still very high uh and they fear that if they relaxed uh and said uh you know let's call it a day this would only be a pause before the russians came back again so i think the the the, the ukrainians still feel themselves to be under an existential threat even though um, they, they they put it uh, they pushed it back, shall we say, for the moment, and, and can see ways forward to guaranteeing their security in the future. That again depends um, on on NATO and the EU. Um, for Russia, you know, this started as a special military operation, notionally um, with, with quite a limited intent, which was to secure the position of um, the, the pro-Russian uh, enclaves in Donetsk and Luhansk and in, in the Donbass, um, and then gradually expanded, as is often the case with wars, into much more basic, uh, much more uh, ambitious objectives, uh, taking in uh, Kherson and Zaporizhia uh, uh, as well, plus holding on to Crimea. Uh, and I still think it, it's actually very difficult for Russia to imagine a stable speed, a stable um, peace with a hostile regime in Kiev. I just think that's basically now part of the Russian problem. 
Mm. Um, it's not existential for Russia, but if it withdrew, um, then you know there's regime change in Russia or the Russian state collapses. And a particular reason why that should take place, or if it does take place, it'll take place for very Russian reasons, not because of Ukraine. Um, so uh, that's why um, you know Ukraine will carry on fighting, and, and Russia doesn't need to. But the problem is uh, for Putin, this is quite existential. I mean, this is his thing. This is his legacy. And he's so far, he's blown it. Um, and so, you know, part of the problem is that Putin um, is nervous about a peace um, that doesn't give him something that he would recognize as a victory. So he will keep on going. Um, and that, I think, is uh, it, 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 without regime change in Russia, it actually is quite difficult to see the incentives that Putin faces for to, to end the war, other than a growing sense of frustration and futility in the Kremlin and in Moscow and in the wider Russia. So it's not existential for Russia. Uh, it is for Putin. Uh, and um, uh, it, it wouldn't be the end of the Russian state. It could be lead to a different sort of Russian state if, if they ended it. Um, but so far there's no incentive for them to do so. So we we could argue, in fact, is it fair to say that the stakes for Russia have actually risen simply because the war has gone so badly for them? And yeah. is, is what's at stake now Russia's status as a great power? And is that in itself existential? Um. Yes. I mean, I, I think it's certainly the case that the stakes have risen. Um, I mean, this is just the nature of war. Uh, I mean, the, the thing, you know, you talk about what Russia might want uh, in January 2022 and the different ways they might get it and the role of diplomacy and uh, the, the possibility of some deal on Ukrainian neutrality or, or whatever. You can talk about all of those sorts of things before the war. Once you start a war, uh, that adds an interest. Not being defeated becomes an interest in itself. Uh, and as I've already noted, as the war has gone on, um, Putin has raised the stakes. Uh, it wasn't initially about annexing territory. Now it is. Mm. And that's a massive change in, 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 in Russian interests. The great power point is a very interesting one and, and difficult to get the measure of. I think it, it is important to Russia to be seen as a great power. It's always been important to Russia to be seen as a great power. Um, the, the sense of being second to the United States, arguably now third to the United States, is uh, it bothers them. Um, and you can see that quite a lot of that in in the rhetoric and in um, the, the way that they play the BRICS and the, the, the nature of their relationship with China. But I think the problem for Putin, and this may uh, over time have an effect, is that uh, Russia is being diminished as a great power. I mean, there's nothing that says you're not as great as you thought you were by trying to occupy a weaker neighbor and failing. Um, uh, and, you know, they can bang on about their nuclear capabilities, um, which are, are not irrelevant in this conflict. Um, but it, you know, that, those by themselves have not cowed Ukraine. Um, and, and Ukraine's fighting back and has embarrassed the Russians. They've lost a lot of kit. They've lost a lot of people. And while it's true the economy um, is on a war footing now and production is, is rising, you know, basically the business of Russia is now military, mm. um, that by itself doesn't turn you into a great power. And I think they must can, can see international diplomacy now moving on without them. I mean, they haven't been particularly involved in the diplomacy around Gaza. Uh, Z and Biden have met. Uh, relations between US and China hardly warm, still suspicious, but on a slightly better footing than they were uh, a year and a half ago, Z is, is clearly pretty unimpressed with what Putin has done, whatever he may say. 
I think the, these have all diminished Russia as a great power. And I think that that is something that does nag away um, at the elite in Russia. I mean, they're, they're bothered by it. Mm. Well, Laurie, snow is now beginning to fall on the battlefields of Ukraine, which means the summer fighting season's over and we can perhaps draw some tentative conclusions about Ukraine's counteroffensive launched in June. Uh, Ukraine equipped several divisions with, if not state-of-the-art Western equipment, then certainly near state-of-the-art Western equipment uh, for, for that summer offensive. What's your overall judgment now about the successes and failures of Ukraine's counteroffensive? Yeah, I mean, as it happens, I mean, I think the conclusions that I drew in the book still more or less hold, um, and that was in what, August, early August. Um, uh, it's so slightly odd that the the, the public conversation. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think I was out of line. With the analytical community, but the public conversation has sort of caught up with the sense that the, the uh, perhaps overstating it that this was all a failure. I think it became apparent um, quite early on, uh, certainly by the end of July, that um, the sort of optimism with which the coming offensive was spoken about in the spring was overdone. Um, first. Well, mainly because what the Ukrainians are trying to do is very difficult. Um, and, and as I you know, again point out in the book, um, the main lesson you draw from all the fighting is it's very difficult to overcome well-organized defenses, well-resourced defenses. The Russians you know, failing again at the moment to do so uh, with any sort of decisiveness. Um, they failed at the start of the year when they had an offensive then. We ended up with Bakhmut, which is turns out to be pretty useless for them. Um, so it wasn't surprising that Ukraine struggled, um, but it was apparent that they were not going to get great maneuverist breakthroughs quite early on, and they adapted to a more sort of attritional form of warfare quite quickly. So I think there is a sort of disappointment that there's not more to show for it, and it's quite hard, I think, for outsiders to get a sense quite of the, of the reckoning in terms of um, the consequences of the uh, of the um, uh, of who's lost more and uh, what it means. The Ukrainian offensive hasn't stopped. They're still picking away. Um, they've had one big success, which I don't really talk about in the book, uh, which has been more apparent over this last few months in, in really making the Russian position in the Black Sea extremely difficult um with, given that they don't have a navy it's quite impressive um uh, by using drones missiles and so on making the support of the, the port of Sevastopol very difficult to use um setting up their own corridor to get grain out so that's quite important they've they've just established a, a bridgehead on the eastern bank of the Dnieper which is again complicates Russian planning. But meanwhile, you know, the Russians are checking stuff at uh, Avdivka, um, trying to have the, the, their own offensive uh, and still suffering from this basic problem that the defence turns out to be stronger than the offence. So I think the, the pessimism at the moment is, is a bit overdone um, in the sense that uh, I think we've known for some time that this was unlikely to achieve the dramatic breakthroughs and I think the, the, but we also know that the coming months are going to be difficult because, not because they're, they've run out of equipment, which the, the Russians sometimes appear to do, uh, but because of the problems of shell shortages and, and people shortages. So it's a tough time for, for, for Ukraine. And I think there is a, a, a an, an avoidable degree of frustration that the hopes that they had in, in the spring were not realised. Um, but, uh, you know, sadly, I think this is, this is also about the management of expectations. I think they, mm. uh, I think people got ahead of themselves uh, and didn't fully appreciate just the difficult. I mean, there's all sorts of other lessons about training, um, about you know, the amount of time you, 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 that, that they got to prepare for the offensive. Everybody was in too much of a rush, probably. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you just needed more preparation. 
And you say what the Ukrainians were attempting was difficult. We might actually go a little further, couldn't we? We could say it was unprecedented in the sense that uh, in modern times, no military has made major territorial advances without first achieving air superiority. Can you say something a bit uh, about the air war in, uh, over Ukraine? Yeah, I mean, I mean, because the Ukrainians did have a breakthrough in in early September, twenty twenty two at Kharkiv, um, but that was because the the, the Russians were, were blindsided by, by their preoccupation with Kherson, and there were just very thin defences in Kharkiv, uh, and and the Ukrainians, you know, quite cleverly and effectively took advantage. So there, there was a precedent, and I think it's also fair to say that there was a tendency to assume, which I, I was probably a bit guilty of as well, that um, the Russian armed forces um, were a bit sort of weaker and demoralised because of, because of the losses and the losses of their officer corps. Um, but actually, if you, you know, when you're talking about holding lines, it's somewhat easier than um, when mounting offensives. Air power is important. Um, and again, this is one of the puzzles of the war, because if you look at a lot of the um, pre-24th of February 2022 projections, Russian air power is scheduled to play a really important role. Um, and it hasn't, you know, it's not been unimportant, um, but you know, the Ukrainians still kept flying. Um, they didn't. Uh, Ukrainian air defences were more effective, I think, than the Russians prepared for. Remember, the Russians' recent experience had been in Syria, where they faced very little uh, by way of air defences. Um, so it hasn't been a very happy time for the for the Russian air force. But of course, the Ukrainians don't really have an air force, um, uh, except you know a small number of planes. They're getting some F-16s coming in. Um, so the sort of way that the West would have mounted an offensive which is basically you batter the defensives um, uh, in, in preparation, didn't happen. Um, they could use artillery to, and high mars for, 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 for that sort of role. But it's, it's not the same effect. And you can't call, you know, as you suddenly find yourself facing opposition, harder to call in close air support, as, as the West would do. So um, I think... You know, again, early on in the offensive, it, it was a pretty obvious point to make that the it's very difficult for the Ukrainians to do it without air superiority, and so it proved. Um, and that will, you know, I, I think the F-16s will be more helpful in in blunting Russian uh, air power than than, than uh, making necessarily a lot of difference in, in future Ukrainian offensives. Um, but that also just underlines a problem that the, the you know, Ukrainians point to, and, uh, which is that the West, having seen the need, is sometimes pretty slow to provide the capabilities. Um, and, you know, so quite a lot of the what ifs revolve around earlier provision of equipment uh, and, and training to Ukraine. It took really until the start of 2023 before there was serious thinking about what it would need to help the Ukrainians to win battlefield victories. If we'd started to think harder about that a year earlier, um, then uh, the Ukrainians might have been able to take much more advantage, for example, of the Kharkiv breakthrough than they did. So, you know, there's lots of what ifs here, but, you know, we are where we are. Um, and uh, Ukraine uh, still has some fire advantages, uh, but it doesn't have air power. Well, let me now press you then on that point about Zelensky, about his leadership of Ukraine and the support he's getting from the West. You write in the book about uh, the, his ability to galvanise world opinion and to draw military aid to Ukraine. Am I right in observing, though, that in more recent times, Zelensky cuts a slightly frustrated figure? Uh, particularly when it comes to his relations with the US and Europe? What what explains that? It, 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 yeah, I think, we, again, this could be overdone. Um, you know, the fact is that NATO countries are committed to Ukraine. Uh, it, it, it's not just, they're not just doing it for Zelensky or doing it for Ukraine. They're well aware that if Russia was successful, 
the consequences for European security would be dire. Um, uh, and also the, the, the consequences for the credibility of, U, of NATO and the US would also be dire. Having backed a country in this way, a country that is prepared to fight, still prepared to fight, and sort of let it down. I mean, this is this is on a scale far greater than Afghanistan. This would be um, very bad indeed. So I think they're still committed. They say they're still committed. Uh, they're still making um, the issue is. Um, getting the budgets through the EU and through Congress, uh, whether there are spoilers in both entities. Um, but I think they'll do that uh, if they don't. That adds to the difficulty. Um, and, um, and production, where uh, in the US, um, shell production and so on is, is certainly picking up and uh, can make a difference in the EU. Um, and UK, you know, it's moving forward, but not anywhere near as quickly as they said it would and, and should and should have made it. So the, 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 there are issues, there are practical issues. Um, and, you know, so Zelensky clearly is very frustrated. Um, I mean, he's in a very difficult position. This war's been going on a long time um, and it takes its toll. Hmm. Um, you know, just the, 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 the uh, you know, he, he sells up pretty well. And also, of course, you're seeing tensions emerge within your uh, Ukrainian society and politics and so on, which were suppressed or, or you know, just secondary during the during the first months of the war as everybody came together. And seeing, you know, more tensions and divisions now, not not that surprising. But uh, again, it's not that surprising, and therefore, I don't think we should um, assume it's this that brings Ukraine down. I don't think that's that's at the moment the risk. Um, but it does need the long-term support of the West. At the moment, I think that's there. It's not really uh, an enormous burden on the West to support Ukraine. You know, and, 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 and uh, I don't, you know, at the moment, I don't see them uh, stopping support. But, you know, you've actually got to turn the good intentions into practical deliveries. And you haven't mentioned the T word, Laurie, Trump. Trump. Well, so, so the, 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 this uh, this confidence that you have in Western resolve can that survive a Trump administration? And there's a well, who knows, but possibly not. Um, uh, and you know, it is generally assumed that that, that that that's one of the things Putin's waiting for. Um, although he he denies it himself uh, on, uh, when he was asked that. Uh, he said uh, when Trump was in power, sanctions on Russia were increased, which is actually true. Um, and I wouldn't want to rely on Trump for anything uh, <laughs> myself, because whatever, I mean, whatever Trump does, Trump does for for, uh, for, for his own narcissistic reasons. Um, so I wouldn't assume anything. Uh, but, but but I think nonetheless, it, it, it's at the back of everybody's minds. Um and I think the, the Biden administration will do its best to um, get enough stuff to Ukraine that can keep it going for some time. But, but that's an issue. I mean, of course, uh, if um, I think it's hard, it's hard to imagine anything else of comparable impact, um, you know, changes of government in um, in the UK and, or, or the uh, uh, we, we'll have our, our elections next year. Um, it's not going to make any difference. The opposition is, is very supportive and so on. Um, Germany doesn't have an election for a while. And anyway, the Christian Democrats, I think, will support Ukraine. Who knows after Macron? But, but, but it's a Trump the, 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 that's uh, uh, the question. And, you know, you can have endless, question, endless conversations with Americans about will Biden stand and um, what differences all Trump's court cases make and so on and so forth. It's all speculation. It's still a year to go. Mm. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it's silly to dismiss it as an issue. Well, let me offer something else then that might be of comparable impact, and that is the, the weight of numbers. Uh, I read recently that 
uh, the average age of Ukrainian military recruits is rising uh, pretty dramatically, uh, and that there is that, that that national morale, if I can put it that way, is not is perhaps not as strong as it was at the beginning of the war. There's less willingness to join the military effort. And of course, the, the, the Russian economy, uh, despite being heavily sanctioned, uh, is not nearly as badly hit by this war as Ukraine, whose economy effectively collapsed upon the invasion. Um, is it just a question of Russia being able to bring more bodies to the fight, more equipment to the fight, and more economic weight to the fight, and that that will eventually decide the question? Um, n- not necessarily. I mean, take the economy first. First, Ukraine's economy is growing. I mean, it, it did uh, it did contract enormously last year. It's growing. Um, uh, it's also got a bit of a war economy with money going in. Um, you know, the Western Ukraine is all booming in, in its own way. Um, so it, it, it's not that the, the 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 Ukraine economy is on a complete downward path. Um, I mean, there's a massive amount to be done with it, and with all the corruption issues and so on. And then if you look at the Russian economy, yeah, it's growing. I mean, first, R- Russia, so long as Russia can export energy, um, its economy won't collapse, but it can export energy. So, um, and, you know, if the oil price goes down, it, it, it's in trouble. If it goes up again, it's, it feels better. Russian economy is on a war footing, but but that means uh, it's got labour shortages, it's got supply shortages. So what you're actually getting now is an overheating economy. It's growing. Um, you've got to be careful because nobody actually knows fully the statistics of the of the Russian economy, but it's growing. But the inflationary pressures are now considerable. Interest interest rates have gone up uh, to quite high levels. Um, and you don't get any sense from polling in Russia of great enthusiasm for the war or uh, optimism about the future. Um, I mean, they can keep going and, and they're not going to collapse. And they, um, you know, they they basically offer sufficient financial incentives for people to keep on signing up. I think you know the, the point about the old Russian soldiers is true. The old Ukrainian soldiers is true, um, but that's partly because um, a lot of those that were drawn in in the sort of the first wave of mobilization were those with experience, and they therefore tended to be that much older. There's actually quite a lot of youngsters available, many of whom haven't been fully mobilized yet. Uh, so they do have more that can come in. They need training, and I think that's... Uh, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily... Um, they're going to run out of people. Uh, they have to use, you know, in a more open society, the sort of losses that the Russians have incurred would be and should be totally unacceptable in, in, in Ukraine. You know, throwing thousands of, losing thousands of people over the last few weeks to take one place in in um, Donetsk is is not something the Ukrainians um, would be prepared to do. So I think the chat. The challenge for the Ukrainians uh, over the coming year is one of finding people, to be sure, training those people, conserving those people, so accepting that the sort of grand offensives, um, which you know a year ago they were starting to imagine as being decisive, you, you've got to put that out of their heads a bit. At the moment, that, that's going to be very difficult. They, they need to find ways of fighting that, that gives them time to um, train people better, uh, bring in more equipment, um, reinforce their positions. Uh, and, that, you know, and that's not easy while the Russians are continuing to attack. So that, I think, is the challenge. It requires a different mindset. And I think that that's true. I think you know the Ukrainians one talks to. Um, of course, uh, you know it's tough. It really is. Um, but you don't get any sense of a loss of determination to carry on. Mm. It's just wearing, uh, you know. It, 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 and I think um, 
you know, this is a people that's in their history have been through many horrible events, uh, some of it at the hands of Russia, like the famine of the 30s and so on. Mm. Um, the, 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 there's, a, there's a resilience and a resolution that I, I still think is there. But of course, uh, it, it's not as, um, they're not as buoyed as they might have been if, if they were regularly giving the Russians a bloody nose. It, it, it's, much, it's, it's a much tougher fight. And, and it requires a much more realistic assessment of the situation in which they find themselves. Mm. Now, you, you spoke there, Laurie, about the Russian economy. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you for an economic analysis. But the Western sanctions regime was quite unprecedented in its toughness. Never before had a great power been subjected to economic coercion and punishment on quite this scale. The swift payment system closed to Russian commerce, uh, oligarch bank accounts frozen, access to foreign currency reserves blocked, imports of key technologies stopped. So I just wonder, do you, do you think it's had any effect on Russia's behaviour in the war? And can we form a judgment about whether these measures have worked? Um. Yeah, I think the, the, the general assessment was that they worked to a degree, uh, but clearly not enough. Uh, I don't think they were ever likely to work enough. I, I mean, I'm, I think I'm always a bit of a sceptic about what economic sanctions can achieve against uh, an opponent determined to find ways around them that's big, you know, is, is resource rich um, on its own terms, has countries that are not prepared to enforce sanctions against them. It has held them up. It's, it has created shortages of um, microchips and so on and so forth. Um, they, they find workarounds, but they are workarounds. But it's very difficult. In any way, a lot of the time, the role of sanctions is, is almost a political statement. This shows how cross we are with you. Um, the, 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 you know, how, how can you expect us to do business with a country that is behaving so badly and so on? Um, and, you know, there are questions about whether all the oligarchs were that worth sanctioning. Some of them, um, I mean, I think it was a misplaced view of Russian politics that these guys, you know, called the shots at all in Moscow. I think a long time since they've done that. So um, uh, I, I, I was always sceptical myself, and I think you know one of the problems was the belief that this could substitute for the hard material support for Ukraine, which is it makes much more difference. So you know it, it hasn't helped Russia; it's turned Russia. It, it, and one of the things that's difficult to know is what sort of state Russia is going to be when it comes out of this. You know, it, it, it's it's devoting a third of its economy to completely wasteful activity at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's still a lack of investment in other industries, in, uh, in in the energy sector, and so on. Um, it's lost its customers in Europe. Um, so, uh, for all these reasons, I'd be... Um, uh, I think it's too early to judge about the long-term impact. Putin in his speeches tends to enthuse about autarky, you know, that, that, that it's, a, it's great to be self-sufficient. Um, but actually, it's pretty limiting to be self-sufficient yeah. uh, in a way. Uh, so I think the long-term prospects have been quite damaging to the Russian economy, even though in the short term it's sort of booming on the basis of uh, of a sort of war economy but um you know war, war the, the letdown from a war economy can be quite brutal mm. larry i want to bring us back from the grand strategic level uh to the battlefield situation and some recent comments by ukraine's senior military commander general valeria yeah. zelushny who described in an interview described the war as being at a stalemate and that caused some friction with his president, right? Who denied uh, that term? What, what do you think? Is stalemate the right the right way to describe the war at the moment? I don't like the word stalemate for all sorts of reasons. Uh, it's a bad analogy from chess to start with. Um, you know, stale, a stalemate in chess is the end of the game. Mm. You know, uh, 
and, and that's not what he means. He means deadlock, um, um, a lack of progress. And it's not static. The situation isn't static. Um, but, uh, I mean, it, that and the accompanying article he wrote were very candid, which I think is a good thing. I, you know, I think I'd rather my generals were candid than, than, than sort of the cheerleaders like Shoigu and Gerasimov on the Russian side. Um, and, uh, you know, what he's trying to think through are, are these really re- very important questions about um, how do you uh, keep the war effort going, prepare for the long term when the when uh, conditions are not particularly favourable in the short term. And I think that's what, that's what he's trying to do. Zelensky's job clearly is to keep up morale and, um, you know, give his people hope. Um, so I think he found the language uh, Zelensky had used unfortunate. Um, but, uh, you know, this isn't unusual again in wars. The, 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 you, you, and I think, it's, so again, it's not unhealthy that, that you have these uh, different perspectives. Oh, I think the, 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 there is a problem in Ukraine in the, you know, Zelensky um, uh, is is a civilian with no, mili- no military experience um, who's done a really good job in getting external support in and in embodying a fight and so on. Uh, but in the end, he's still dependent upon his generals. Uh, and, you know, some of the generals, I mean, there are also divisions amongst the Ukrainian generals. I mean, it's normally put in terms of those very much of a Soviet mindset who are prepared to throw large numbers of people uh, at a problem, and those um, who are more modern, reformist, who are looking more for technical solutions um, to, 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 to improve um, the military technology of Ukraine, which is you know, the thrust of a lot of um, of the essays that Lindy wrote to go with his uh, um, uh, economist interview. Um, proving electronic warfare, drones, and so on, things like that. Um, which, yeah. you know, it, it, it's something that, you know, the, the, things like electronic warfare don't tend to get noticed very much, but have made a major impact on this, your ability to jam the drones um, so, they fall, so they fall out of the sky, uh, the ability to spoof air defences or whatever. All of these things are really quite important. So it's fair to say, isn't it, Laurie, that uh, he was describing in his comments and in his article something really quite similar to what you were talking about at the beginning here, which is the difficulty in modern military conditions for either side to make major breakthroughs against prepared defences. Yeah. And he he seemed to say that some kind of major technological breakthrough was required to, to get over, to, to, to break this stalemate. Uh, what, what do you think he meant? What is it about this war that makes it so difficult for either side to affect decisive breakthroughs? Well, the strength of the defence. I mean, if you're well prepared and you've got reserves um, um, and you're agile, you can defend. Um, it, and so even if you know a bit of territory is lost, the cost of the enemy and the time it takes, you know, barely makes it worth it. Um, I, I, you know, my, I think it's going to be very difficult for either side to get um, a decisive military breakthrough. It could happen. Um, you, they, you know, it is possible to find points of weakness and vulnerability that allow you to push through, but it's hard. But this is a very transparent battlefield. I mean, drones are all over the place, so people can see what's going on. Um, but he, but he, I mean, he was looking at things like electronic warfare and drones and um, uh, uh, communications. Uh, I mean, these are the sorts of things where you can do better. I, I, you know, personally, I think that they're important, but the but the training piece is also important. You're asking people without a lot of uh, experience of this sort of warfare to do very difficult things. 
Um, and uh, that needs a lot of coordination, a lot of confidence in what different other units are up to. They don't really have good divisional level of command. Um, uh, they, it's just a gap. Uh, and that's the sort of, I, I think it's as important to um, use the coming months to try to improve that as it is to um, uh, you know, innovate. The, the, the innovation is important, but, but I think these things uh, are also important. And you come back to this point about not winning. Um, it, it, it's frustrating for the Ukrainians while Russians are still occupying their territory, but it's frustrating for the Russians too. And I think part of the challenge also for the next year is to add to the sense of frustration in Russia. In Russia, um, in the end, it matters to them if they if they are not achieving their objectives, uh, and we shouldn't just assume that they're the ones sitting pre sitting pretty waiting for Trump. I think Putin finds it pretty frustrating that after all this time and effort, um, Eve is still free. And um, that uh, he hasn't gained more ground. They've really put a lot of effort into taking more territory this year, as well as the Ukrainians have, and they've got very little to show for it. Mm. So, Laurie, as we come towards the close of our time, I just thought we'd, we'd lift our gaze towards that grand strategic level again. And I want to ask you about nuclear weapons and, and tell me if this is a, a, a reasonable characterization. There's a, there's a fascinating section of the book on nuclear weapons. And it seems to me that while nuclear weapons, thank goodness, no nuclear weapons have been detonated in this war, they certainly have been used in this war. What role have nuclear weapons played? Yeah, I, I, I mean, this has been one of the sort of constant themes of a lot of the public debate is that this will go nuclear very quickly. And, I, and I've never subscribed to that. Um, but I have the view I have taken is that nuclear weapons have been important in, in a sort of customary deterrent role. Putin has been absolutely clear that the, the, the role of nuclear weapons is to deter NATO from getting directly involved fighting side by side with Ukraine. And that he succeeded. Um, NATO has not got directly involved. And, and when they're pressed to get so involved, as with uh, no-fly zones quite early on, um, that's the reason given. Uh, equally, uh, Russia has not uh, attacked neighbours of Ukraine that are helping with its supply. That's also uh, nuclear deterrence. I never, th I mean, it's important that you, Russia never directly threatened Ukraine with nuclear use. Um, uh, I mean, to start with, it, it never expected that that would even be an issue. Um, and it, you know, it's not, it doesn't make an awful lot of sense, um, especially if you're aiming to subjugate you, Ukraine or consider this to be your territory. So um, it, I think it's been a debate that uh, could have been conducted in a calmer way, uh, acknowledging the role that the, the weapons play, accepting that we have been deterred in some ways as, as because of Russian nuclear power, but not panicking ourselves into, into thinking that we dare not let Ukraine do well in battle, um, lest this suddenly prompts Putin to do something even crazier than launch the invasion in the first place. So um, that's where I, 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 I began on nuclear weapons and where I still find myself. So accepting that we have been deterred, that's very interesting. And, and I want to just take us out of Europe and to, uh, to the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, it's commonly argued that the, uh, the Ukraine war ought to or, or has given uh, the Chinese some pause about the prospects of, uh, of winning a, a military campaign over Taiwan. Could it be argued equally that it ought to give the Taiwanese some pause in the sense that uh, the United States will be just as deterred from taking on another nuclear power, just as it has been in the case of Russia? Yeah, um, I think they're both fair points. I mean, certainly, um, you know, if I was Z, uh, 
and some generals came bouncing up to me with some uh, exciting and, and uh, plan for the decisive defeat of Taiwan. I, I hope the Russian experience would make me at least ask some questions about is this going to be so easy in practice? How do you, you know, if the Taiwanese don't want us there, how easy is it? <clears throat> how easy is it going to be to impose our will? Now, these these still seem to me very basic and fundamental questions. I think he'd also be noting that the uh, allies held together, um, that NATO unity has not collapsed. Um, if anything, you know, American leadership has been in place and sort of worked. So all, the, all of those things um, I would have thought would be helpful. Uh, I think under any circumstances, a direct fight with the Chinese would be worrying for the Americans. Um, but a lot of this depends on how you assume the Taiwanese scenario would unfold. And, you know, does it start as a freedom of navigation issue and blockade issue? And in a sense, oh, would, would, would the Americans be daring the Chinese to attack American ships rather than the other way around? And, and so a lot, there's lots of very particular factors that, that would be involved. I'm sure the Chinese believe that the buildup of their nuclear capabilities um, reinforces their deterrent. Um, uh, but they've still got to work out, you know, what's it worth? You know, uh, it's, what, what is Taiwan really worth, uh, given um, they know that uh, uh, the US has still got the ability to to uh, take out all Chinese cities. So I, I don't think, um, I, I, I still hold to the reasonably optimistic view that the effect of nuclear weapons is just to make people cautious when they come to clash with each other. Um, obviously, if that caution evaporates, then nuclear weapons mean you're in a much more calamitous situation. So, Laurie, only time for one final question, and that's about your own thinking on this question, on the Ukraine war and on uh, on warfare, modern warfare more generally. Um, I'm curious to know... What have you changed your mind about over the course of the Ukraine war? What did you believe, say, 12 months ago that you no longer believe? Um, it's a fair question. I mean, look, I, 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 was, I was always prepared to believe that, that Putin would invade Ukraine. You couldn't dismiss the possibility, but I always thought it was stupid. But I still think it was stupid. It was a foolish thing for Russia to do with catastrophic consequences for Russia and Ukraine, certainly for Ukraine. Um, the reasons why I thought it was stupid, I think, remain relevant. It's very difficult to occupy even a chunk of, a, a, of another country. Whatever your uh, advantage is, and over time it becomes harder, uh, even if you... Um, you know, you can build up your your military forces. I guess what's what's always I've always found difficult is to try to work out how Putin would get out of this. And I was sort of optimistic in early September 2022 that um, the Russian military had been sufficiently embarrassed. And were in sufficient difficulty that they really might try and cut their losses. Um, that turned out to be just too optimistic. Um, and by the end of the month, and certainly into October, I became pessimistic, and I've been pessimistic ever since about a, an early end to the war. Um, I mean, I don't think I was that. I've been that surprised by developments on the ground. Um, I don't think I've, I think what we haven't talked about, what's, what's interested me a lot, is the role of cyber and so on. Um, and again, I, I, to be honest, I don't think, I don't find myself surprised by that or the, or the limits of information campaigns. You know, my, my view 
of all wars is, is always to pay close attention to the political context, um, not just the, the operational issues, but other people know a lot more than I do about the operational stuff. And, the, um, and as we've discussed, I mean, the hardest thing to get a grip on is that political context and to fully understand not why you know Russia did it, but why it hangs in there and why, and why uh, nobody seems to be trying uh, to find a way out on that side. You know, a lot of the debate in the West seems to assume that if uh, you know some sense was knocked into Zelensky and realised he's never going to get this 18% of his country back and told, uh, you know, now to put some imaginative diplomacy, that you get a great Russian response, but there's no evidence for that. Um, so um, I'm puzzled still by, by, by all of that. I don't particularly think it's a question of right or wrong. I'm just trying to evaluate the issue. So I think the challenge continually is is in the politics. Um, there are always operational surprises, the roles of you know, just how important cheap drones have become. I don't think people fully predicted that. They didn't think drones would be important. The importance of thousands of cheap drones, I don't think people fully appreciated that and, and, and how that could compensate to some degrees for limits in air power. So the, the things we've learned f from this war that will be uh, applied to, to future wars um, but it's the, it's the politics that, that, that always um, is hardest to fully get a grip on. Well, Laurie, once again, congratulations on the book and thank you for your time today. Thank you, thank you Laurie, and thank you for joining us for the launch of Lawrence Friedman's Modern Warfare Lessons from Ukraine. Once again, the book retails for $12.99. Here in Australia, it's available at all good bookstores and online. If you're joining us from outside Australia, we recommend purchasing via penguin.com.au. Thanks for joining us and see you next time.